Good morning, everyone. This is Denise Broom with the Engineering CAD Systems Office, and I'd like to welcome you to this week's Weekly Wednesday webinar. We are in the process of going through the Advanced Road Course, the FDOT Manual. And this week, we've made it to Chapter 8. Chapter 8 is on earthwork. So this morning, we're going to talk about earthwork and basically earthwork and the way that we generate our earthwork is off of our cross sections. There's a few notes that I wanted to point out that are in the manual. Um, if you go to chapter 3 in the PPM, and I do have that already up, there is a general introduction and then there's a lot of information in the PPM on the different types of materials, how we need to calculate everything. But two, I wanted to point out, and, and actually there's three, but right here it's telling you that we're paying for all of the cut as regular excavation and we're not differentiating between suitable and unsuitable materials. And number four down here is basically the same thing, is that we're paying for all the material excavated below the finished grade template as subsoil excavation, not differentiating between the suitable and unsuitable. That is per the PPM, and as we go through the class, we'll be talking about the different types of excavation, and we'll be talking about the subsoil excavation as we go. But I just wanted to point this out and to point out the chapter in the PPM as a reference. It's, it's a really good reference to use. It gives you some basic definitions as well as, and this is also in the manual, this is where it came from, was out of the PPM. But you'll see, it, it gives you a good understanding of what they're considering to be fill, what they're considering to be cut, as well as the subsoil. So all of this is considered, I mean, the, the layer may be down here lower, but subsoil is everything that you have to excavate in order to construct the roadbed below the finished surface, or the finished, I should say not surface, finished template of your roadbed. Anything that you have to excavate above that is considered cut, okay, and paid for as regular excavation. And then the fill would include that entire area of the subsoil that we excavated. That would all be fill. And Geopack calculates our earthwork like this for us. We just have to know how to set up the dialogue. So just kind of keep this in mind. That was chapter three and volume one of the plans preparation manual. Okay. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is how does Geopack compute our earthwork for us. It uses the average end area method, which is, as of right now, that's the way that we want it to be done according to the FDOT standards. And it uses the elements in our cross sections to determine the area and multiplies at times the distance between our cross sections. I wanted to get a little bit more into that than what is actually in the manual. So how exactly does Geopack determine the areas when it's calculating our earthwork? First thing it has to do is find an enclosed area on our cross sections. Once it does that, it finds the centroid of the area, which may not exactly be in the center of the particular area, but it's once it's done that, then it determines what is the material type. From the material type, it is able to then go and determine and look at what's there and say, figure out, okay, is this cut? Is it fill? Is it proposed um, <coughs> undercut? You know, what is going on with that? Um, it's very important to understand how it works so that when you go to set up your earthwork dialogue, you have an understanding of what is Geopack looking for in order to determine the type of earthwork that it needs to calculate. So the first thing it does is find an enclosed area. And so this is just zooming this out. And by the way, these slides are courtesy of Derek Gray at Bentley. He's allowed me to use these to help train on how earthwork, I had to put that in there. So once it finds an enclosed area, through the slide, 
So it finds all of these enclosed areas. Then it goes to each one of those areas and it has to find the center of the area. And how does it do that? So in the example shown, um, it's pretty much in the center of this block. There's the centroid of that shape and this is the centroid of this shape. Once it finds the centroid, it goes to that location and then it goes straight down to the first element that it finds and it compares that to the material types that we're going to set up and it's real important that you understand how it does that so it's not looking at the top it's looking down and it's using the level symbology of that element to determine the material type so in this example the red line is telling it it's asphalt it's going to go down find the pink line and that's going to be rock base. And then it's going to go in, and we're over on the curb and gutter over here. The green line says it's concrete. And then most of the time that works just fine. In this particular shape, you'll see that the centroid is way out here and it's going to go down and it's going to find the existing ground, which is what I want it to do so that it knows it's a suitable grading and it will go in and it will calculate that fill area for me. Sometimes it doesn't work. You notice this has got a steeper slope so whenever it goes to find that shape and goes down if it finds a different material type below it other than the existing ground it's going to see that as being something else. So in this case this orange G colored um, area at the bottom, that would be a proposed undercut. I don't want it to calculate. I'm just I'm explaining this so that you're aware of what it's doing. Um, it would then go in and calculate this area as a proposed undercut. So you want to be careful and watch what it's doing. Um, and it, it it's just a good practice really um, with any of the geopack tools. Most of the time, yeah, it works, but every now and then you may run into something where, no, it may not be doing what it needs to do. So always do a check. Um, and if, if you've ever watched me do any of other things, it, you'll see that in all of my training, I'm always saying, go back, use the tool, clear it, reuse it, you know, recheck to make sure, say, the ad hoc, so that, that it's been set the way that you want it. Um, double check everything behind it. Um, just in case you may run into something along these lines. Okay? Alright. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and jump in. I'm going to get out of my slideshow. I just wanted to show you that. It, pictures sometimes are better than words. Um, I'm going to go into MicroStation. So, um, I already have MicroStation open and we're in the rdxs rdo1.dgn okay and there's my cross sections and according to we're going to kind of do content with exercise as we go here um, so let's go ahead and let's open up the earthwork dialog um, if you open up the road tools where are my road tools? They're usually up. Road tools. Okay. And you go to cross sections, you will see that there is still an option sitting out there that says Earthworks. This does not work. <laughs> Alright, you'll notice that this is a blank dialog. There's, you can tell it to load, which I don't, I don't even have it. AFD file. This is why you're looking for the right file. Um, not AFD. Is it that? I don't know. Those aren't it though. Um, even if I were to try to load a file into this, it's not going to come up and work. Earthwork has to be opened up through Project Manager. So I'm going, to go into, I'm going to go to the road workflow and I'm going to open up project manager and actually if you I know it's in here quantities 
Um, there is an option under quantities on this task to open up earthwork. And if project manager isn't open already, it's going to prompt you to open up project manager. So State Road 817 is our project. I'm going to tell it OK. And why can't it find it? Oh, that's because I unzipped it again. Um, I need to go back in and I think it's in here. Ha, there it is. I'm going to clear this because it is in my working directory. The only time you'd ever want to set this job GPK directory is if it was in another folder besides the working directory. So if you're working in a roadway folder, the GPK is in the roadway folder, leave this blank. Okay. Um, tell that okay, tell that okay, and now it should open. Yay! Um, I'm going under JDO for my user. I'm going to tell it OK. So now I have Project Manager open. And I want to click on, you'll see it down here towards the bottom. See the earthwork? I want to click on earthwork. It's going to prompt me for a run. And that run we want to call according to the manual following the steps. I'm going to call this baseline EL817. And give it a, some kind of a description earthwork for the main line. Um, tell that OK. Select 817, tell it OK, and you get the earthwork dialog with everything in it like we want. sink. There we go. Okay. And we're going to start from the top. And I don't think it gets into the file options, um, but they're basic file run. Uh, basically, once you have the dialog set up, it runs the earthwork. You have file save settings. Um, again, you'd want to hit file save settings before file run. Um, and you also have the option to export, and this would export the input file, which we don't have one yet, um, but it would it export an input file of what it's running to calculate the earthwork. Okay, and I'm going to cancel that. Cancel. All right, so for the cross section DGN file, this should be set up correctly. Um, if you're in the cross-section file and you have the working alignment set, which in this, for this data set, all of this has been set up. So it knows that this is where my cross-section file is, and then I'm using the RDXSRD01. Tolerance by default is set to 0 0.01. Tolerance is something, and I want you to be aware of where this is at. It's underneath the XSDGN file section. Sometimes when you run earthwork, you're going to run into situations where the earthwork doesn't want to cooperate. Um, if anyone has ever run cross sections, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, the tolerance is used to determine if two elements are actually connected. Um, sometimes you have to raise this up and make it higher, like to say 0.1. Sometimes you have to make it smaller. Um, it's really a matter of trial and error depending on the sections that you're running. It is best, I'll throw this in here, um, when you create your existing ground cross sections, it is best that you create them using the line string option. It will, it doesn't eliminate the issues that we run into running earthwork, but it will make it better. Um, it, they run smoother if 
there's if if the existing ground is set as a line string. Okay, vertical search distance. Okay, this and I thought by default it was 250. Okay. Well, let me rephrase that. By default, it will look 250 feet from the cell up and down um, in order to find the elements for um, in order to calculate your earthwork. That's a pretty big area. Um, the vertical search distance is saying that that's going to be larger and be aware of this um, so it, instead of it searching 250 feet up and down it's going to search 500. Keep this in mind whenever you um, set this up because if you cut your existing ground cross-section cells to a um, you told it to put these in here closer together and I've seen a lot of people do that they'll change it from the default of 500 feet um, you'll want to change that and make it you know say if you if you put them every 200 feet apart which is not recommended I really recommend just leaving it to the defaults uh, vertically 500 and my columns will be a thousand um, but if you do, you'll, you're going to want to change this so that it's not actually calculating and looking in two cells at the same time. That's going to give you a lot of problems. Um, so check on the vertical search distance. Um, baseline is populated from the cross-section cells in here in the file, um, which I don't have the cells turned on, but we're using baseline 817. And it knows that in this file I have cross sections from station 76 to station 120. You can go in here if you don't want to calculate the entire project. Say you want to calculate just a portion. You can do that um, just by coming in here and typing in a different station value. If there are regions, make sure that you type in the R with a space and one and you get this formatting right because Geopack doesn't like it when we like if you don't have the space in there it's, it's pretty particular but if there are regions make sure you have the regions specified alright soil types and this is probably where we're going to spend quite a bit of time um, this is pretty much the heart and soul of trying to get earthwork um, set up correctly. All right, just kind of going through making sure I don't miss anything in the manual. Um, soil types tells the criteria or the tell not criteria tells Geopack um, what it is that I'm searching for and when it finds it it tells it what type of what to do with that material um, I just got a question and before I get too much further I want to go ahead and answer it um, can you explain the regions just a little um, regions are sections of the of your alignment that typically if it would started at station 10 and went to station 100 and all went well and, and it's all um, what's the word I'm looking for? There, the, there's no equations within that that distance. Then everything would be in region one. If you have a station equation along your alignment, and say you got to station 20, and you said, okay, station 20 is actually we're going to equate that to station 52. Okay that station equation breaks the alignment into two different regions so from 10 to 20 would be in region 1 52 to 132 would then become region 2 and so on and so on as, as many 
station equations that you may have in your alignment. Does that make sense? I hope. All right. Soil types. Let's get back on that. Um, soil types are, like I said, they they're telling the telling the earthwork program what it is that we have. Um, there's different classes. We've got existing ground, existing suitable, existing unsuitable, proposed finished grade, proposed undercut, and an excavation limit. All of these have to be defined with some the level symbology. We've got to tell it what we're looking for. All right, so first thing you have, and, and you have to have at a minimum the existing ground and the proposed finished grade. It has to have at least those two in order to calculate anything. So the first thing we want to do is set up the existing ground. And I'm just going to click on the working alignment definition because I've already defined this in the working alignment. So I can just toggle that on instead of searching for everything. Um, I need to give it a soil type. The soil type is very, very important. Most of the time, I would probably say on, well, I'll, I'll say probably 75, 80% of the projects that we run Earthwork on, you're just going to get the normal cut and fill. That's all you're looking for. And this would be the same. And the soil type that you use, um, I'm just going to call this Earth. The soil type name that I give it allows Geopack to differentiate and give me quantities or separate quantities for different things. So if I have a proposed undercut, say overbuild, then I can create a soil type with an, a proposed undercut as overbuild. And so it'll give me my regular excavation and fill all lump sum together. But it'll take that proposed undercut quantity or the overbuild and give me that separately. So defining the soil type and, and giving it a specific name is going to help you get to that end of separating out the different quantities as you go. Um, so the soil type, very important. And your existing ground and your proposed finished grade should have the same soil type. Okay. Factors. Roadway excavation, subsoil excavation, and fill. These are all in here if, if you meet, most of the time we leave this to one. But basically, if there is a the one of the sh the swell and shrinkage factors of the different materials, um, you could put that in here. Right? But I think most of the time we just leave it at one. Okay. So once I've given it given it a soil type, given it a name, let me tab out of that. You'll see that the add button unghosts. So I want to click on add, and then it adds it to my list box at the top. I want to go back in again and now I want to tell it the proposed finished grade. And it's important to know too that the order that I place these in here are important as well. Because if I have more than one element on top of one another, say I have overbuild or a proposed undercut element and a proposed finished grade element and they're sitting on top of one another on my, in my cross section. When it goes down and it looks at the elements that it finds, it's going to see, ooh, I have a proposed finished grade because it's going to go in the order of the list and it'll find that element in the list first. So it will assume it to be proposed finished grade and not the proposed undercut. So putting these in here in the right order is important as well. Okay, so and that'll also help you maybe in figuring out, like if you go back and check all the shapes and you can see what it calculated it and how it calculated it as, it'll help you understand, you know, looking at those elements, what it did. So proposed finished grade, I want to untoggle the working alignment. With all of our levels being by level, I can really untoggle all of these. 
I'm going to hit reset and I'm going to zoom in I don't want that one I want one that has the traffic separator and that is not drawn as traffic separator I really did is type B curve okay these are old cross sections all right so under soil types I basically the easiest way to do this is to click on match and start clicking and you want the entire temp template and as you go you can turn on display so everything that you have already grabbed and put in this list it'll highlight for you that way you it's kinda like a check visual check to make sure you have all the levels specified I have a driveway over here so I want to select it let me just go through bring up my cross-section navigator and just to double check make sure I have everything because all of our sections aren't always the same um, bring up the navigator Zoom in a little. I'm going to smooth that dialog off for a second while we check this. What is that? Okay, I don't want the overbuild. That would become my proposed undercut, and we're going to do that in a later exercise. It looks like we got everything. We'll know when we run the sections. Um, but try to get everything in there. You don't want to just wholesale put in here. The, it, Geopack does recognize the asterisk as like a wild card. Um, you don't want to do that within this filter right here simply because it will try to what it does behind the scenes is it tries to list every level that we have that's on that you know like if you were to asterisk underbar px it would try to grab all of those levels and we have so many of them that there's not enough there's a there's a character limit within this dialog so it's best to simply grab those that you know you're using. Okay, once you've got all of your levels, I'm going to click on display and click add. And that adds the proposed finished grade into our dialog. For exercise one, this is all that we need. But I'm going to go ahead and explain to you um, some of these other material types. Um, we have existing suitable. Um, basically that's existing material that is out there that can be reused on the project. Um, and it doesn't it doesn't have um, an effect on like um, say subsoil or whatever. Um, it's we're saying that this is a material say for example like topsoil this is a material it's a suitable material and it's all good um, and it can be reused existing unsuitable is the exact opposite it's out there but we don't want to use it um, uh, muck is a good example um, we don't want that under our roadbed so if we do soil borings and we find it, then we really need to have that removed. Okay, I had a question. Was the soil type for proposed to be the same as the existing? Yes, it was. Because I wanted to calculate all of my regular excavation and my fill together and add all of it together. Um, and it will do that with the same soil type name. All right. And again, like I said, existing unsuitable, this is for materials that I need to remove. 
Um, and I do not want, and GeoPack will, with the right setup, it will reuse a, a material type again as part of the fill, and it'll calculate. I had, you know, 900 cubic yards of topsoil that we removed and we can put back. Um, and it can give you that information. Um, existing unsuitable, unless my template goes through it, it will not, by default, it doesn't remove it, um, but I can force it to remove it using excavation limit lines. And I'll get into those in a minute. All right. Um, and you'll notice most of this dialogue really hasn't changed. Uh, we've already covered the proposed finished grade. Um, that's our entire template because I don't want it to calculate any earthwork from the top of the asphalt to the bottom of the base because that's all being paid for as you know base and asphalt. Um, I only want the cut and fill area that I need. So. Um, the next thing that I have is the proposed undercut. Proposed undercut and exist, the existing unsuitable, you would want to give those a more um, descriptive name or if you know the, the soil type, put that in here. Um, an example that I've been having a lot of people ask, well, how do I get this set up for is overbuild. So for proposed undercut, I would set this to overbuild. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and do this simply because we don't have a whole lot of time. Okay, so I can set, I would rename this to overbuild because I want it to give me a separate quantity. I don't want it to lump it in with the regular excavation. I want to give it a set, give me a separate quantity um, for the overbuild so that it's not included with the rest of my earthwork. Okay, I can, there are a couple of options in here. Um, common excavation only. Um, and what that is, it's, if you want the undercut to be included as common excavation rather than the subgrade excavation, then you could toggle that on and it would put it in with the common excavation. Okay, subgrade excavation obviously is the material underneath your template. Um, there's also the toggle here for do not include in the mass ordinate. The mass ordinate is a running total basically of the cut and fill balances as you go through the project. Um, if you do not want that quantity included in that mass ordinate, then you toggle that on and it wouldn't include it. Okay, again, I would have to come in here and I'm going to untoggle these and I would need to set the symbology. I can do that by hitting reset and clicking match on the overbuild and add that. Okay. And last but not least on our list is the excavation limits. Excavation limits are basically a straight line designating the outside edges or where I tie to the existing ground. If you use the FDOT criteria um, from FDOT 2010 or any of them actually from V8 on, um, we automatically do this for you. You'll always see the excavation limits on your cross sections. They're on the level excavation limits under bar DP. And let me go ahead and set this one up. I'm going to click oh, reset match. There are some rules to using excavation limits. Um, as I work here, so I've set that, I'm going to, and there isn't a soil type for my 
excavation limits. It just needs to know where they are. Um, so now I've added everything in here. And I can go back and select any one of them, make changes, click modify, and, and on from there. Um, but the excavation limits, there's a few things that you, that you need to know. One is that you have to use them in pairs. It has to have two. I can't put another one in the middle and have it work. Um, if I wanted to calculate just my left roadway, then I would have an excavation limit here and one in the middle. And then it would calculate just over here. Um, same thing being said, actually I have a slide for this. Uh, dang it. Let me see if I can slide down to it really quick. All right. They have to be in pairs. Um, and you have to have lines. You cannot have line strings, arcs, whatever. It has to be a line and it has to um, cross and it's best if it's where it ties but it has to cross in here where it needs to be. Let me go up. Okay. Um, in the slides it gives you an example. I'd see, if you notice, if I wanted to calculate this area in here, then I have to make sure that my line crosses all the way through the limits um, of where that area is at. I don't want to stop it in the middle of this layer of earth here. Um, and this example says this is much better. We want it to cross everything and I have it's on either side okay by default and this may be easier to explain with these slides by default what Geopack will do when it calculates your earthwork is it will cut calculate the cut in the fill okay um, and that being said it's this is fill area and the purple is a cut. Okay, that's what it does by default. If I need it to take out this existing base, okay, then I need to tell it to use those excavation limits. And that's in the dialog, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. But I need to tell it to use the excavation limits, and it forces it to take this material out when it does my cut. Okay? And then it will fill that area back in when it calculates the fill. Make sense? So if I have material under my template that I want to have removed, then I have to use these excavation limits in order to get it to calculate. Okay. All right. This is just showing an example. Sometimes you have to take out suitable material to get to the unsuitable material and it will calculate those if you've set these up as an existing suitable material. If, for example, the pink line is designating topsoil, then it will calculate that as two different quantities um, if you've set it up using the existing suitable and unsuitables and you force it out and it will extract all of it because it had to get the topsoil out in order to get to the clay. All right. They can also be used, like I said, in order to get the limits of the um, unsuitable material. If you'll notice it keeps going beyond this unsuitable material goes off who knows how far out. But I only want to calculate it between the lines. So when it does the calculations it finds there's the cut, that is a cut, and this is the unsuitable material down here. But it's only calculating the area to the excavation limit. It's not going on forever out there. Okay. 
And in order to use the excavation limits, this is on another part of the dialog, but I'll go ahead and hit it now and we'll skip it in a minute. Um, this part of, if I wanted to use the excavation limits, I have to have it, one, I have to have it defined under soil types, and two, I have to tell it by toggling on calculate only between excavation lines or limits. And that will make it use in order to calculate your, your earthwork. Okay. Go back to microstation. How do I get out of my way? Okay. And that puts us going right on. Um, earthwork shapes. Do I have any questions? I don't see any right now. I'm the soil types. I hope I covered everything well enough. Again, you guys know you can always call me with questions or email me afterwards if you, if you think of something as you go through it later. Okay, moving on with the dialogue. Next section is earthwork shapes. If I wanted to draw earthwork shapes, and I usually do, um, I tell it to draw the shapes. I toggle that on. I want to, by default, it's on default. Um, so I'm going to leave it on the default level. Normally you would put that on Earthwork 1 underbar PX, and that's step 20 on page 821. But I'm just going to leave it like it is. The other toggle here is to stratify the shape color, and I do want to tell it, yes, that I want to stratify that, that shape color. So basically what that's saying is that for each material, it will give two colors, one for cut, one for fill. So if I have regular excavation, I'll have, you know, say white and blue, and it follows the color table. It starts with white, and it follows through. So I'll get all the different colors, and that way at a glance, by looking at it, you can tell by the color of the shape that all of this is the same type of material that it's removing um, based on the material and the operation. Okay, so that's what the stratify the color, shape color does. Output format. Um, these top two toggles, accumulate adjusted or unadjusted volume column. When you run the earthwork, it will give you a report, basically, and if you run it with the log file. Um, and in that report, I can tell it to add columns in there um, for the adjusted and unadjusted volumes as it goes through. Um, so those are an option. Calculate only between excavation limits. The first go around, I'm going to leave it turned off so that you guys can see what it does. Um, and the end area decimal places, that's how far out you want it to carry the decimal place. I'm going to, most of the time I think we set that to two, but one or two is fine um, because earthwork is calculated as cubic yards and cubic yards is to, to the nearest um, whole number, so um, one or two, probably, but I think we usually do it at two. two. Um, and then the bottom section down here is common excavation, subgrade excavation, subsoil excavation, and fill. Those are all of the different types of operations or what it's going to calculate my earthwork as. Um, if I want to see all of this broken down in my report, then I would leave it just like it is. I uh, can also have the option so that it will take the common and the subgrade excavation and add that together and show that is one quantity and the subsoil excavation separately. And then if I and then show the fill. I also have the option for subgrade and subsoil together and common separate along with the fill, the subgrade separate. I think you get the picture or I can just show all of the excavation and all the fill. I'm going to leave it at excavation and fill for this. It doesn't, I mean, it's just the way that it, it, it shows it, and it's to your preference. All right, adding and subtracting volumes. Sometimes you're going to know that we need to add 500 cubic yards for um, some miscellaneous, something that's going on on the project. And you know you're probably going to need to add that into your quantity. That happens. All you do is just specify the type because it and it grabs the soil types by that the names that I gave my the soil types at the underneath up here. I had earth and overbuild, so when I came down here, it knows that. And it 
will give you those options. So I can add earth or I can add overbuild quantities, a lump sum amount, and when it processes everything, um, and I can tell it where, what station it's going to be, what type of um, operation it's going to be, and how much it's going to be. So whether it's a fill or an excavation quantity, I can add that volume in, populate these, click add, and then when it processes, it will add this into its calculations. Centroid adjustment, this option, it's, it's usually good just to leave that on. Um, centroid adjustment is there to make adjustments for the curves in your project because as you go around the curve, your pattern line, it's going to be, they're not, they're not equidistant from one another anymore. They're closer on one end than they are on the other. Or if your alignments on one side of the, you know, it's like out on the, the right side of the right ditch and you've got all, every, all your calculations are on the other side of the, you know, closer to one end, you can get things that are calculations that are not quite right because it's just taking the average area multiplied times the distance. But in that case, like if I'm on the outside of a curve, that distance between cross sections is greater than um, if it, they were parallel to one another. So it takes that into consideration and it finds the centroid of your shapes and adjust the distance in order to get the correct calculation. Um, I, I would say the more correct calculation. It's really hard with earthwork because you've got a lot of things that go on and especially if you've got, you know, every, every hundred feet, there's a lot of things that can happen in that hundred feet to make a difference. Um, Skip areas, skip areas, and this is, and I wanted to point this out to you guys, um, because I always have to come back to this in the document, because I get asked this question, I think, once every six months. <laughs> What's the difference? And I always wind up having to look it up because I'm always afraid I'm going to get them backwards. Okay, skip areas are, um, if you tell it to, to skip the area, then it will process your cross sections and do all the calculations until it gets to that begin station. At that point, it stops calculating and then it will go to the end of that area that you specify. When it gets to that end station, from there, it starts and it begins your calculations anew. So I get two separate quantities and anything in between it doesn't account for. So it skips it, okay? Ignore areas will take from that begin station and end station and it ignores all the areas on the cross sections that it may find within that station range so it doesn't gather any more of the area but it will um, take from the, the, the last cross section before that begin station, take that area and calculate a quantity of excavation for you or fill and multiply it times the length over until it gets beyond the end station to that next cross section. So I still get a calculated quantity through that area. Okay. Um, Skip areas uh, would be like for driveways and such. Um, ignore areas would be more like um, bridges at the tow slope stations because um, you don't want it to calculate. The bridge itself you would want to ignore, um, actually skip because there, there is no earthwork there. Just skip it. All right. And populating these, I mean, again, just begin, in and hit add. You can always delete and modify. Okay. So that's the skip and the ignore. 
sheet quantities. In order to geopack, in order to place the quantities onto the sheets, it uses a special format um, of a file and it reads that file um, to get the station and then the quantities and get them into the right columns and you get the right formatting on the sheet. Okay, and it uses a different file for that than the report that it gathers. And if you want it to create these so that you can clip the sheets and have it put it on the sheets, you'll want to fill out this portion, portion of the dialog. So I come in here to sheet quantity, I give it a name, um, I usually just use earth, whatever. Um, the number of dis decimal places, I'm just going to give it two. Um, columns, you start with column one, and this is, I think, confusing for some people. Um, column one, I'm going to set it to earth, common excavation, and end area, because I want the area column first. The way that it goes on the sheets is area, volume for my excavation, and then I have an area and volume for my fill, and if you're using one that has the subsoil, it'll have a subsoil area and then volume column. Okay, so I want to set these columns up so that I get the right numbers in the columns. Um, once I have this and I want to add these together, so I'm going to hit add and it puts it in my list. I leave the column at one, the, the soil type to earth, common, change it to subgrade, hit add. And this is a good practice um, because it will give me, um, unless you have the subsoil separately, then you wouldn't want to use this one yet. Um, but it will put these in here. Um, you're accounting for all of the excavation that the program may think it sees. Okay? This is the way I always set it up to get my um, text file. The next thing that I need, I'm going to start back at common excavation, I need the volume. If I've turned on the adjusted volume, or the centroid adjustment, I'm going to want the adjusted volumes. Um, this is up to you, adjusted or unadjusted volumes. Um, click add, go through the same process, add subgrade, add subsoil, get all of that in there. Column 3 is still earth. I want to change it to fill, I want the end area, add it, and then I want to change it to my adjusted volume, add that. So now I have, um, oops, I didn't change that column, change that to 4, because it's a separate column, hit modify, okay. So now I have columns 1, 2, 3, and 4 and it will automatically give it the extension on the end. Tell it to write the sheet quantities and you've set everything up like you need it to do. Um, I know it's 10 o'clock and I'm sorry, I'm usually trying to get through this. It, it, I think I actually did fairly well trying to get through it as quick as I did. Um, so file save settings and that generates that input file um, in the background. Tell it file run and I'm going to create a log file. Um, I'm going to name it Earth. That way the information that it generates will be, um, I, I'll have that saved. And this is the error message that you can get a lot of times. Um, Time-wise, um, the best tool that you can use to try to correct these, I'm going to explain this one to you because this is important. Undercut elements must always connect with either a proposed un another proposed undercut element or the proposed finished grade. And this is telling me that I have a proposed undercut element somewhere that isn't connecting. The best, easiest way to find it is to take and use the line command. So go up to drawing, I'm going to grab the line command and then click data point. And if I zoom in, this is where it's saying it's not connecting. The best tool that I have found is the modify tool when you're dealing with earthwork elements. In order to move that element, 
using some of the other modify options, like using the extended intersection, sometimes that doesn't always work. Even using the modify doesn't always work. And at that point, if you still can't get it, skip it. See which, you know, notate that cross section. And you may have to go back in and redraw those elements in. I've actually seen that happen before too. But when that doesn't work, then you're going to start wanting, wanting to play with the tolerance. Bump it up, bump it down until you can get it to start calculating everything for you. It's one of the more frustrating things. You'd think, okay, you went through all this time and effort to try to get the cross sections right, and then you go through and you have to do earthwork, and you have another different nightmare. And it, it can be very frustrating. Sometimes it works really well, other times it's very frustrating. And you can go into, that is a text file if you have to, and adjust the text file that gets sent out. Normally I can hover over the shapes and it gives me the information I want, this information, but for some reason it's just not for me right now and I'll have to figure that out. You can also use the attribute viewer in order to identify these so that all of the blue shapes, they are earth with a operation type of fill and it gives you the quantity in it for that area. And you can kind of glance through, and the white areas, obviously, those are going to be cut, and it sees that as common excavation. And if you'll notice, it also went ahead and calculated that proposed undercut. If I had come in here and I had set this base as a existing suitable or existing unsuitable material, then I could have made it, if I had run it just like I did without turning on the excavation limits, then it would have... Um, not calculated it, but if I turn them on, then it would. And I just want to show you real quick, it does generate, this is my log, and this is basically, this is telling you what it did, what levels were set, the columns, how it was all set up, that's basically your input file, and then for each section, it's giving you the quantities, and it's giving you the end area, there's the square feet, and there's the cubic yards, and the adjusted volume for the cubic yards for the centroid adjustment if there is one. This is a pretty straight job, so there probably isn't going to be. You won't see much of a difference when you look at this. If there's overbuild, it's giving you, if you'll notice, it's all a fill quantity, not excavation, but it's giving you the quantity for the overbuild as we go. So th this is a good kind of a review to kind of look at it, and when you get to the bottom, it's giving you more of a table format, and it also gives you a summary of all of the overbuild, the different soil types. It gives you the quantities. Um, the summary of that, and there's the centroid summary. If it had to, it, this is where if it adjusted anything, you would see a difference in the length in these columns, which I don't think it had to. Yeah, actually it did. Um, so it did adjust that, that length when it started doing the quantities around that curve. That is an example, and I wanted to show you real quick. This is an example of the formatting that it creates whenever it uses this to place these numbers on the cross-section sheets within our cell, um, cross-section sheet cell, okay? The first column, this is what I told it to be excavation. It has a total of, I think it's 10 characters in here. That's how big that number can be. So I, it's giving it the station with the region number, and then it's giving me all the columns. If you had to go in and adjust this by hand, say you had one section that just would not run, and you skipped it, then you can come in here and you can, for example, say I had 79 plus 50. You can come in here and modify this, or say you added a cross section later, um, and just calculated real quick, calculated that earthwork area by hand. I usually keep a spreadsheet. Just make sure that these are spaces, make sure this stuff lines up under these column numbers, 5.32, and I don't know, I'm just throwing numbers in. Those aren't nearly right, but I usually use an Excel spreadsheet to calculate this as I go. But you can then go in here and add that in and then it'll be there so when you go to put those sections on a sheet it will put it all on there for you. I hope you guys have a really wonderful day and a great week and I hope to see you again next week. Thank you!